Howdy folks, thanks for stopping in at Dad's Toolbox. In today's video, I'll be building my second rabbit tractor using some different materials and carrying forward what I've learned from my first build. So stick around. If you found this video before you found my first build video, I'll post a link so that you can check out that video as well because I used some different materials and made a few mistakes that you may find useful to watch out for. I have also already recorded an update video that addresses some flaws in my design and the solutions I came up with. I'll be editing and publishing that video just as soon as I'm done with this one. For this build, I'm using wood left over from previous projects and reclaimed wood from when a portion of my fence blew down in a storm. I had a few pressure treated 2x6s left over from my garden bed project and had been sitting along my back fence for a few years. Since this wood had been sitting around for a while, the first thing I needed to do was to clean it up a little bit to keep it from gumming up my tools. Nothing major, just a quick uh, brooming off with our boat and RV scrub brush to get the dirt and leaves out of the picture. When I can, I use a speed square to assist me in making straight cuts with the circular saw. While it may seem like extra steps, for me, it makes my cuts faster and more accurate. All I do is line up the blade with my mark, and then I slide the square along the material until it touches the base plate of the saw. I line the saw up with the square and make my cut while holding the saw against the square. When using saw horses, remember to adjust how far apart they're spread based on the length of the board you are cutting. Do not cut between the saw horses. If you cut between the saw horses, the board will fold in the middle and pinch the blade of the saw. Depending on how powerful your saw is, it could fling the saw back at you and cause some pretty gnarly injuries. Make sure you don't have too much of the board hanging off the end of your cutting setup either. It could fall forward while you're cutting and cause any number of undesirable situations. If you are cutting a board near the center and have a lot of wood hanging past your sawhorse, you can place some weight on the back end of the board to counterbalance the board to keep it from falling forward as well. Also, check your wood for uh, warping and twisting as you go. Cutting boards can change the tension in the wood caused by the wood fiber's influence on each other, turning your once straight boards into modern art. I cut the 2x6s down to the various rough lengths I would need prior to milling them down for width because it's much easier to handle shorter boards and it's easier on your tools, especially consumer grade tools like mine. I milled down the 2x6s on my table saw. Milling is just a technical way of saying that I cut the wood down into narrower pieces. Since I have a small table saw, I have to use another stand to catch the wood for me as it exits the saw. While it's nice to keep the wood from falling on the floor and dinging it up, for this project it's solely a safety concern. By supporting the wood as it leaves the table saw, I reduce the amount of force I have to apply on my end of the board as it gets closer to the blade. The harder you have to push on the board to keep it in contact with the table and the fence as you feed it through, the higher the chance that you will lose your grip and the farther your hand or push stick will travel if it slips. If you want to keep your hand in your fingers, you need to take steps to keep the feeding of the material through the saw as smooth and easy as possible. Now this thing that I'm using as a stand is actually the folding base for my wet saw for cutting tile. I use a ratchet strap to adjust the height to suit whichever work surface I'm using. The first cut I made is called a rip cut. Rip cuts are when you make a cut down the length of the board. I was after an inch and a half by inch and a half square board that was four feet in length. This left me with a piece that was an inch and a half by four inches by four feet. For those who may not know, the common names for lumber aren't the actual dimensions. For example, my 2x4 is actually an inch and a half by three and a half inches, and the 2x6 I'm milling in the video is actually inch and a half by five and a half inches. When you're making cuts on the table saw, make sure to put the straightest side against the fence so that your cuts are as straight as they can be. Also, make sure the smallest side of the cut is on the outside of the blade if possible. Small boards can be hard to handle when they are between the blade and the fence because the options you have to handle them are also smaller. If you are unable to push the offcut all the way through, it could get twisted or shift between the blade and the fence after the cut, which could cause a blade to grab the board and shoot it back at you. This is called kickback. Depending on where you're standing and where your hands are, kickback can cause some pretty serious injuries. The second batch of cuts I made created four inch and a half square boards, two feet in length, and four inch and a half by four inch by two foot boards. The third cut I made netted me an inch and a half square board about three feet in length. The fourth set of cuts I made created two inch and a half square boards, four feet in length. In between the cuts, you can see where I measured out an inch and a half off of the cut side, marking it, and then I flipped the tape around to measure from the other side. 
This is because whenever you make a cut, you lose the material your saw removes when it makes the cut. So your board's dimensions will change based on the width of your blade. I wanted to make sure I got an inch and a half off cut, so I measured the wood that I had left, subtracted an inch and a half, and then measured from the fence to the outside of my blade so that I would have what I wanted on the outside of my cut. On the second cut, you can see that the first half of the cut gets kind of difficult to feed because as I'm cutting, the tension in the wood fibers is changed by the cut in such a way that the board starts to close on the end, pinching my blade. The riving knife, that little black thing sticking up behind my blade, prevents kickback by preventing the board from pinching the blade so hard that the blade grabs and throws the board back at you. The fifth batch of cuts I've made is called resawing. Resawing is when you cut a board in such a way that you end up with two boards of the same length and width but are thinner than the original board. For example, you can resaw a 2x4 and get two 1x4s of the same length, or you can resaw a 4x4 and get a 3x4 and a 1x4, and so on and so forth. When resawing a board on the table saw that's wider than the depth that your saw can cut, set the blade a little higher than half of the board's width. This makes it easier on your saw, which goes back to the making it easier to feed rule I mentioned earlier. Also make sure to flip the board end over end so that you're placing the same side of the board against the fence that you used on the first cut. The sixth cut was a resaw of an inch and a half by four inch by three foot board that resulted in two three quarter by four by three foot boards. And the seventh cut was a four footer of the same dimension. In the eighth set of cuts, I resawed all of my top rails down from one and a half inch square to one inch by inch and a half because I'm really just making this up as I go. I have an idea what I'm after, but not a strict plan. While this approach can be flexible, it can sometimes cause unforeseen problems. Anyway, once I got everything milled down, it was time to cut them to finish length. Pro tip, sometimes depending on how much accuracy your project demands, you can use your first cut to mark the rest of your cuts. Just make sure that you use the same board to mark the rest of your cuts. Once everything is marked, you can run them through the miter saw or whatever you have, all in one go. The first batch of cuts were all at two feet and the second batch was all at three and four feet. The next step in my process was to build the corners of the tractor. I did this by attaching two of my two foot one by fours to one of the two foot inch and a half square pieces I cut. I used glue and my nail gun. You could easily substitute screws or a regular hammer and nails if you don't have a nail gun. I chose glue construction because glued joints are far stronger than joints made by fasteners and I didn't want to risk splitting the wood. Also, in the humidity near the Rio Grande River, nails and screws have a tendency to rust away to nothing, and the wood moves so much it actually pushes the fasteners out sometimes. I chose Titebond 3 glue for this project because it's waterproof when it cures and it's rated for outdoor use. The nails from the nail gun are just to hold the pieces together while the glue cures. I set the corner pieces aside to dry for a while and gathered up some of my reclaimed fence planks. Part of my fence had blown down in a recent storm and after I repaired it, I saved the old wood to salvage what I could. The thing about salvage wood is that you don't always have exactly what you need. You have to adapt what you have into what you need. In this case, I had some old slit warped and cupped boards that were roughly the right thickness for the task. I sifted through them and picked out the boards that had sections that were straight enough and long enough to fit the bill and took them to the saw and cut the portions out that I'd used. As with the other boards, I cut off the parts not suited to my project and tossed them into the scrap pile while I used my first cut to mark the rest. I cut 10 boards which was enough to wrap around the back half of the tractor to provide shade for the rabbits. Next, I set up the router with a straight flush cut bit that I had removed the burned up bearing from. To hog out the material in preparation for the half lap joints I plan to use for the outer frame. I used half lap joints because they are great with glue, they reduce racking, and they make the structure lighter. They make the structure lighter because you're actually removing wood off of your boards, so less wood, less weight, right? I wanted a nice light tractor that my wife or either of my kids could move without any assistance so that the rabbits could be maintained when I wasn't available. In my first build, I cut the dados in the boards before I put the corner pieces together. This time around, I put the corners together and then cut the dados because where the two boards are butt jointed at the outer corner, one of the boards needs a dado on the face as well as on the edge. With the pieces assembled, I was able to cut them both at the same time, and I had more material to hold on to to maintain control of the piece. 
To be fair, the method I'm using to do this is pretty rudimentary and borderline barbaric, but it's also efficient and it got the task completed in no time. I cut 4 inch dados in the bottom of the corner pieces to accommodate the bottom rails, and inch and a half dados on the top to accommodate the top rails. The rails were dadoed the width of the corner pieces plus overlap. Take care if you're replicating this method to decide beforehand which way you're going to face the corner pieces because one side of the corner is the width of the face of the board and the other side is the width of the face plus the width of the edge of the board. Next onto the router were the horizontal rails. Pro tip! If you don't have a dust collection system, a blower attachment for your air compressor works like a charm to keep your work area smooth and free of sawdust. It's also worth noting that if you plan your work properly, you can cut all of the dados of the same depth before having to set your fence for a different cut. The key to doing this is to have all of your boards cut to length prior to setting up the router. It also helps to make your longest pass first and work your way toward the end of the board. This assures a nice straight shoulder for your half lap. Don't forget to dado your top rails like I did. On this build, I chose to build the base first. It turns out that the way I did it in the first video was better. By doing it in this order, I created a large, floppy, and fragile piece that I had to manage while I tried to attach the remaining pieces. Some clamps and glue and a nail gun made quick work of the joints. Since I'd forgotten to dado the top rails, it ended up giving the base some time to dry without me moving things around. I attached the top rails in the same way, but with a little more difficulty because the corner pieces had shifted while I was away. Nothing a few wax with a mallet could handle, but nowhere near as easy as the first build. I threw some clamps on it for good measure and moved on. While the top rails were curing under the clamps, I started installing the fence planks. They were cupped pretty bad, so I attached them with the hollow part facing outwards. This allowed me to attach them to the side rails with a nail on each corner. The idea here was to provide shade for the rabbits, but to allow for airflow between the slats. My little buddy Mason came out to help. He likes building stuff, and I really like to let him participate. It makes him feel like a big boy. I installed all but the last slat on each side. I had to skip the glue because of the lack of contact surface due to the cups and the boards. So, I ran a screw in the top and bottom of each slat to keep the nails from pulling out. With that done, I popped off the clamps and grabbed the plywood I planned to use as a lid. I bought this plywood at Home Depot for this project. It's light and it's thin and it's inexpensive. They call it underlayment board and it's either 3 16 or a quarter inch thick. I used my sheetrock square to lay out my cut and cut it off with my circular saw. After checking the fit, I started on the frame for the door. I made the frame from some 1x2s. While it could have benefited from some decent joinery on the corners, I figured butt joints would be sufficient because I was using glue in addition to staples. Since there were so few cuts, I figured it'd be faster to cut them with a pull saw rather than setting up another power tool for the job. And then once everything was cut, I checked them for fit. In the previous build, I assembled the top by gluing and clamping the strips in place before I stapled them. I felt like it was kind of fiddly, so in this build, I laid the strips out on the frame as I wanted them to sit, applied glue, and then laid the plywood on top. Then, after a few adjustments, I was able to staple everything down. It seemed to be a little faster and easier, and I think that if I do another build, I may use this method again. After gluing and stapling the strips in place, I laid the lid down on a flat spot in the driveway and I applied about 280 pounds of boot force to the edges to make sure that the, the glue spread out well and there was sufficient contact between the strips and the plywood. The next step was to run the chicken wire. I got the chicken wire started and then installed a slat over the beginning of the run, sandwiching the wire between the slat and the side rails to secure it in place, and to prevent the rabbit from being able to force its way between the wire and the wood. I just used a pneumatic stapler to attach the wire to the frame. I ran the wire on the inside of the frame to protect it from getting snagged when moving the tractor around the yard. I cut the chicken wire on the opposite side of the frame where it would end up in the middle of the last slat. I installed the last slat over the wire and then stapled the wire to both slats where the individual wires intersected. And then I folded over the sharp points and stapled them down as well so that the kids wouldn't get cut up when they went to visit the rabbits. It turned out that my fence planks were just a little too tall, so I cut them flush with the top using my oscillating tool. When I brought the lid over and was contemplating the strategy that I was going to use to attach it to the frame, I noticed that not only had I installed the plywood with the label facing out, the plywood was just a little undersized for the frame and the 1x2s I used for the frame were starting to twist. 
Well, I know this is an enclosure for rabbits that's going to sit out in the weather, and the rabbits are just going to chew on it and crap on it, and they really won't care about the flaws. I couldn't leave it like that. So I came up with a solution that addressed all three issues in one go. I picked up the 3 8 inch offcuts from when I resawed the top rails and attached them to the lid like trim pieces on the opposite side of the plywood from the 1x2s and nailed them down with a nail gun. Watching this now, I don't know why I also didn't glue them. I should have. At any rate, that allowed me to flip the lid over. This put the label on the plywood on the inside of the tractor. It also covered the undersized plywood edges and it reinforced the corners where the 1x2s were starting to pull away. Next, I attached the hinges to the lid. Since my daughter wasn't around to draft into service, I ended up balancing the lid on the edge of the frame and propping it up against the table I was using as a work surface while I attached it to the frame. It was a bit of a juggling act, but in the end it worked out. With the lid attached, I move on to attaching the hold open strap. I used a portion of the same nylon strap I used in the first build. To attach it, I drilled a series of holes in the front center of the lid, making a slot along the trim. I melted the end of the strap to keep it from fraying, and then I fed it through the slot and attached it to the bottom of the 1x2 using a screw and a washer. And the washer is just there so that the screw won't pull through the nylon. Then I opened the lid and marked the center of the top rail held it to where it would hold itself open against the strap and marked and cut the strap. Once I had melted the end, I fed the strap over the top rail and through the chicken wire. And then I attached it to the inside of the top rail with another washer and a screw. Being done with that, I moved right into the lifting system. I still had plenty of half inch electrical conduit I'd used in the first build to replicate what I'd done before. However, I took the lessons I learned from that one and modified my design. I give a good explanation of why I chose the electrical conduit, why I would like to try a different material next time, and the mistakes I made in the other video. So I won't repeat them here. For those of you who have seen the first video, you'll notice that I bent these ones much shorter than the first ones and I angled them away from the tractor. As in the first build, I flattened the pipe with a hammer at the points in which I intended to drill through it to make sure that the drill bit would bite. I also stacked some scrap wood under the pipe to keep my drill bit from hitting the concrete when I punched through the backside. I used some old training wheels I salvaged from my parts stockpile and attached them to the end of the pipe with nuts and bolts and washers. When doing it this way, you have to make sure that the wheel is free to spin. If you run the bolt through the wheel and then tighten the nut down on the backside of the pipe, you'll pinch the wheel against the pipe and it won't turn. To prevent this, you put the parts on in this order. First you put a washer on the bolt to keep the head of the bolt from pulling into the wheel. Then you put on the wheel and then another washer. This washer is to keep the wheel from wedging itself against the nut which goes on next. You spin the nut all the way down until it touches the washer as it rests on the wheel. And then you add another washer to keep the nut from pulling into the pipe. You feed the bolt through the hole in your pipe, you add a washer and then finally another nut. Tighten the last nut towards the other nut with the pipe in the middle. Two wrenches will help you out with this, and that'll leave enough space for the wheel to spin freely. On mine, I cut off the remainder of the bolt flush with the nut. Once I had the wheels attached and resting on the ground, I screwed the pipe to the tractor through the second hole in the pipe, making sure that the screw went through the outer 1x4 and into the corner post. I used a heavier gauge screw for this. I think it was something like a 10 or a 12 gauge screw. It was long enough to go through the pipe, through the 1x4, and most of the way into the uh, inch and a half square corner post. This screw and its partner on the other side form the fulcrum of the lifting system and will carry half the weight of the tractor when you're moving it. So you gotta make sure you use good heavy screws for this. When you drive the screws in, make sure that they're the same height off the ground so your tractor will lift evenly, and don't tighten them too much or they'll pinch the pipe against the bottom rail. Also, make sure that the head of the screw won't fit through the hole you drilled in the pipe. If it does, you can add a washer to prevent this. This design works like a pry bar. When you lift on the back end of the pipe, it causes the front end of the pipe to go down when it pivots on the screw. When the front end of the pipe pushes down towards the ground, it applies upward pressure on the fulcrum, lifting the front of the tractor. Since we put wheels on the end of the pipe, it'll function kind of like a wheelbarrow and allow us to roll the tractor around. Once the lifting bars were attached, I joined the two halves of the handle together using a one foot section of three quarter inch conduit because it sleeves nicely over half inch conduit. With the three quarter conduit sleeved over the half inch, I used my center punch to knock some dings in the pipe so that my self-drilling screws would bite, and then I screwed it in place. During a little function test, I discovered that I had a couple screws from the bottom of the fence plank sticking through the base, so I buzzed those off with an angle grinder. After some tweaks to the handle, everything was working as planned. The next step was to finish off the lifting system. 
I lifted the handle until the front of the tractor had lifted as high as I wanted it to go, and then I marked where the lift bars crossed the back corner on both sides. And then I grabbed a couple of the screws I used on the fulcrum and drove those into my marks. That completed the tractor, or so I thought. I wheeled it into the backyard with the other one and put a rabbit in it and then used it for a few days while watching for problems. I found a few and I dressed them. You can see what my problems were and how I addressed them in the video I mentioned and linked earlier in this video. With that said, I'll wrap it up here. I want to thank you folks for taking the time to stop in and watch this video. And if you found it entertaining or useful in any way, hit that like button and let me know that I'm doing good work. And if you know anyone that's interested in this kind of thing, share this video with them and see if they can make use of it. And if you want to see more videos like this one or see any of the other projects I'm working on, hit that subscribe button. Y'all take care.